This is Imaging of Pelvic Inflammatory Disease, Part 2. I'm Dr. Dan Koval. So in Part 2, I'll discuss the MRI appearance of pyosalpinx and tubovarian abscess and how to differentiate that from hydrosalpinx and hematosalpinx. I'll talk about Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. We'll go into more detail about endometritis. I'll talk about how to differentiate ovarian vein thrombosis from thrombophlebitis. I'll talk about an unusual cause of tubovarian abscess secondary to diverticulitis. And then we'll discuss an important pelvic abscess mimic. Starting with a case, here's a T2 axial image of the pelvis showing the uterus in the right aspect of the pelvis and then a complex multiloculated cystic mass in the left pelvis. This is an adnexal mass showing heterogeneous T2 hyperintensity with thickened hypointense walls. On T1 weighted images, it's hypointense, somewhat heterogeneously so, with some areas of mild hyperintensity. On the T2 fat suppressed image, now that the fat is suppressed surrounding the adnexal mass, you can better appreciate the surrounding inflammatory fluid also tracking into the presacral region. This is a diffusion weighted image with a B value of 400 showing that the complex mass is hyperintense. And on the correlative apparent diffusion coefficient map, this collection is hypointense. So anything that's hyperintense on DWI and hypointense on ADC indicates true restricted diffusion. Here is a uh, T1 fat suppressed post contrast image showing that the Complex multiloculated mass demonstrates thickened enhancing walls. And then that also appears as a multiloculated mass on sagittal reformatted postgadolinium images, very thick walled and hyper enhancing. And then on the coronal images, here are T2 on the left and T1 fat suppressed with gadolinium on the right. You can better appreciate that C shape also seen on the sagittal reformatted images, and that's classic for a tubal configuration. So this is the appearance of pelvic inflammatory disease on MRI. So a pyosalpinx, which is a pus-filled tube, has enhancing thickened walls. And a tube ovarian abscess usually appears as a multi-septated mass with enhancing thick walls and loss of normal ovarian architecture. And these often coexist, as in this case. So the internal contents may not be simple fluid, and they may have restricted diffusion, just like abscess elsewhere, as you may see on MRI of the brain or MRI of the liver. So that, again, the C and S shape of a dilated fluid-filled tube is a key finding and allows you to differentiate this from an ovarian neoplasm. Also, the presence of surrounding inflammatory fluid is another helpful diagnostic clue. So pyosapinx and tube ovarian abscess are usually heterogeneously T1 hypointense and heterogeneously T2 hyperintense, but that signal can be variable if there's associated proteinaceous debris or hemorrhage, as in this case. Something else that you may see is a thin hyperintense T1 rim along the innermost aspect of the tube ovarian abscess on non-contrast images, as you can see in this case, and that's due to the presence of granulation tissue and hemorrhage. This patient also has an incidental endometriotic implant within the right adnexa, as evidenced by that homogeneously hyperintense focus on T1-weighted fat-suppressed images. So here's a companion case. This is another T2 axial image again showing a multi-loculated complex cystic mass in the pelvis. However, this appears more homogeneously hyperintense on T2-weighted images and also has a thinner wall. On T1-weighted images, it's very hypointense and homogeneous. On T2 fat-suppressed images, you don't see any significant surrounding inflammatory fluid, and again, the walls appear thin. Now, if we look at the B400 diffusion-weighted image, this is again hyperintense, similar to the prior case. However, the ADC map shows that it is also hyperintense. And anything that's hyperintense on both DWI and ADC does not indicate true restricted diffusion. That's just T2 shine through. Remember that diffusion weighted images are inherently T2 based sequences, so they do fall susceptible to T2 shine through for anything that's intrinsically markedly bright on T2. And the B value just indicates the strength of the diffusion. The higher the B value, the higher the diffusion, but also the more your signal-to-noise ratio decreases as the B value goes up. Now on the T2 sagittal and T1 fat-suppressed sagittal postgadolinium images, you can appreciate that this collection has a C shape. On the T2 and postgadolinium coronal images, it has more of an S shape, so this is classic for a dilated tubal structure. And this is typical for hydrosalpinx on MRI. A hydrosalpinx is when a blocked fallopian tube fills with serous fluid, simple fluid. And adhesions actually from pelvic inflammatory disease are the most common cause, followed by endometriosis. And then also iatrogenic peritubal adhesions from procedures. And then also any patient that's had a tubal pregnancy can lead to scarring that will block the tube. 
And again, a dilated sausage-like fallopian tube will fold upon itself, forming that classic C or S-shaped cystic mass, again pointing to the fact that this is a dilated tube and not a cystic ovarian neoplasm. And unlike tube ovarian abscess and pyosalpinx, hydrosalpinx will have thin walls, simple fluid signal without heterogeneity, and no significant surrounding inflammatory fluid. And again, the T2 fat suppressed images are a great way to look for any inflammatory fluid. All right, let's look at another case. So here's again a T2 axial image of the pelvis. This time we see a kind of multi loculated uh, T2 hyperintense cystic mass on the left adnexa. But on T1 weighted images, it also appears hyperintense. So we have a T1, T2 hyperintense mass. You might be thinking this could be fat in a dermoid cyst, or could it be hemorrhage? So the next step is to look at a fat suppressed image. And on this T1 fat suppressed image, you can see that the mass remains hyperintense. So it's definitely not fat. It would otherwise suppress similar to the adjacent macroscopic fat that you see in the pelvis and in the subcutaneous fat. So this represents hemorrhage, or, or alternatively proteinaceous debris. Looking at the T2 sagittal image, you can see it does have a somewhat S or kind of collected C shape. So we're dealing with a fluid filled tubal structure. And the T2 sagittal image of the uterus gives you a clue for an accompanying diagnosis that this patient also has. The junctional zone, which is that hypo intense area in the inner myometrium, is markedly thickened, more than 12 millimeters, which is abnormal. And that indicates adenomyosis. So this is a patient that had endometriosis and associated adenomyosis. And adenomyosis is just ectopic endometrial glands within the uterine myometrium, whereas endometriosis is ectopic endometrial glands outside of the uterus. So the fact that we have this T1 hyperintense mass in the left adnexa indicates hematosalpinx. So hematosalpinx is a blood-filled fallopian tube. It's T1, T2 bright. And this is often associated with endometriosis, even if there's no additional evidence of pelvic endometriosis. The tubal fluid will generally be brighter than the dark T2 shading that we see in a typical endometrioma. An endometrioma is an endometriotic implant within the ovary, and it's typically homogeneously light bulb bright on T1-weighted images and dark on T2-weighted images. But we don't see that as much with a hematosalpinx. It's often T1 bright and T2 bright. And again, this may be the only finding of endometriosis. So anytime you see a hematosalpinx, assuming the patient doesn't have an ectopic pregnancy, think endometriosis. Another incidental finding in this patient, you can see bilateral tubal occlusion coils within the uterus causing susceptibility artifact. And that's exaggerated by the fact that this is a gradient echo image, which will emphasize susceptibility artifact. So we have a post-contrast CT scan of the liver. And whenever looking at the liver, it's a good idea to determine what phase of contrast enhancement you're dealing with. So in this case, you can see the aorta is markedly bright, but then also the portal veins are brightly enhancing. We don't see any contrast in the hepatic veins, so this is a hepatic arterial phase study. And that's a great phase to look for hyperemia or hypervascular hepatic masses. Indeed, this patient does have uh, capsular hyperemia along the anterior capsule of the liver. Again, you can see that here on this image, and then on this maximum intensity projection image, it's somewhat exaggerated. Also, this image shows nicely the enhanced portal vein and hepatic artery, which is classic for a late hepatic arterial phase image, which is again the ideal phase to pick up hypervascular liver lesions. If it was an early arterial phase image, you wouldn't yet have portal venous enhancement, you would only have hepatic artery. So we want that ideal late phase. Also, the hepatic veins are enhancing, then we've missed this phase and we're more in the portal venous phase. So this is a patient with Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. And this is a perihepatitis, inflammation of the peritoneal capsule of the liver associated with pelvic inflammatory disease. And this causes a sudden onset of right upper quadrant pain. And it can even mimic right upper quadrant pain caused by other etiologies such as cholecystitis or even right lower lobe pneumonia if there's associated pleurisy. And this can appear as hepatic capsular surface enhancement. And you, again, you'll see this enhancement best in the early post-contrast series, which is again a late hepatic arterial phase. If you ever see delayed phase enhancement, such as in the portal venous phase, that usually suggests more chronic capsular fibrosis in a patient with ongoing capsular inflammation. So here's a more typical appearance that you would see in a patient on a portal venous phase or routine phase image, you can see that there's perihepatic inflammation there causing fat stranding. 
even though I haven't showed you the entire liver on this case, you know that we're not in the hepatic arterial phase because of the kidney enhancement. We're seeing more of a nephrographic phase. With the hepatic arterial phase, which usually occurs about 30 to 35 seconds post-injection of contrast, that's also when you typically see a cortical medullary phase of enhancement. So you know we've passed that phase. Again, you can see this inflammation there in the right omentum and pericolonic fat, and that's uh, extending up from this patient with extensive pelvic inflammatory disease. So on the typical routine portal venous phase that most ER scans are done in, and most routine CT scans of the abdomen and pelvis, usually you'll just see the periapatic inflammation and you won't actually see that hyperemia. You may pick it up if you're reading a CT angiogram for a pulmonary embolism evaluation, however, or other kind of early aortic phase study. All right, let's look at a case here. This is a CT scan showing a patient with right adnexal multiloculated collection indicating tubovarian abscess. It was a patient with four days of lower abdominal pain and fever. There's also inflammation in the presacral region and some engorgement of the adjacent mesenteric fat. But also, if we zoom into the endometrium, you can see that the endometrial canal is fluid-filled with subendometrial enhancement, and that indicates endometritis. So this is a patient with PID who also had endometritis. Another example here, a patient with a C-shaped uh, multiloculated collection in the right adnexa indicating a tubovarian abscess. You can see the extensive fat stranding with fluid, another case of pelvic inflammatory disease, and again, the endometrial canal is fluid-filled, dilated with subendometrial enhancement. And then the incidental finding here, there's a right adnexal mass demonstrating fat density with a soft tissue Rokitansky nodule containing focal calcification. That's just a benign uh, mature cystic teratoma. Here's a more advanced case. This is a patient with gas in the endometrium and these lobular enhancing masses in the endometrium. Note also the endometrial cavity is fluid filled and dilated. Additional history on this patient, it's a female who had a delivery 11 days prior, and clinically there was a suspicion of endometritis. And indeed, this patient did have endometritis. This is a finding most commonly seen in postpartum patients. It's actually the most common cause of postpartum fever. In non-obstetric patients, it's usually due to pelvic inflammatory disease and also instrumentation. And the findings will typically be a thickened endometrial cavity distended with fluid, and you'll see abnormal endometrial enhancement potentially. A small amount of air can normally be seen in the endometrial cavity up to several weeks after normal vaginal delivery. So that finding alone is very nonspecific and often normal. However, you shouldn't see any uh, lobular areas of soft tissue enhancement as in this case. So this patient did have postpartum endometritis and did have retained products of conception with placenta and creta, accounting for those enhancing components. On ultrasound, endometritis also has a fairly typical appearance. Here's a patient, this is a transvaginal ultrasound of the pelvis showing echogenic material within the endometrial canal, very bright, but then also you notice that there is dirty shadowing, meaning that there's heterogeneous hypoechogenicity posterior to the echogenic material, and that indicates the presence of gas. This patient also had a, a CT scan showing uh, gas within a fluid-filled dilated endometrial canal. You can also notice a fan and steel incision from recent cesarean section on those sagittal reformatted images. And clinically, there was suspicion of endometritis. And this was a female patient with diabetes and fever one week after C-section who did have postpartum endometritis. So another complication we sometimes see is, in this case, this is a patient with a small filling defect within the right ovarian vein. Notice that it's non-occlusive and the vein wall is not thickened or hyperenhancing. This is uncomplicated right ovarian vein thrombosis. Remember that the right ovarian vein drains obliquely into the right aspect of the inferior vena cava, whereas the left ovarian vein drains at a 90 degree angle into the left renal vein just like the uh, testicular or granatal veins in a male patient. Here's a different patient also showing thrombus within the right ovarian vein, but in this case the vein is expanded, completely occluded, and there's thickened enhancement of the vein walls as well as perivenous inflammation. And here's a coronal reformatted image showing that curvilinear thrombosis of the right ovarian vein with thickened enhancing uh, vein walls. Here's the normal left ovarian vein by comparison, showing that uh, it is dilated, but there is no thrombus within it and the walls are thin and imperceptible. 
And this was a patient who was also postpartum and had a right ovarian vein thrombophlebitis. So ovarian vein thrombosis and thrombophlebitis are most commonly seen in postpartum patients, just like endometritis, but again, it's something to look for in pelvic inflammatory disease because it can occur. And the right ovarian vein is most commonly involved, as in this case. And if it's thrombophlebitis, the vein will typically be distended and have an enhancing thickened wall with perivenous inflammatory change. And it's important to recognize thrombophlebitis because the treatment is not simply anticoagulation, but it's often anticoagulation combined with antibiotics. And it's not something to miss because septic pulmonary embolism can result if this is untreated. All right, here's another case. I'm showing a fairly familiar appearance now. There's a C-shaped multiloculated cystic mass in the left adnexa with thickened walls, and there's presacral inflammation. This is pretty typical pelvic inflammatory disease with tubo ovarian abscess. However, this was a 55-year-old postmenopausal patient who had no recent history of sexually transmitted diseases. So in that case, you would want to look for any potential secondary causes of tubo ovarian abscess. And indeed, this patient did have inflammation surrounding sigmoid colonic diverticula, and this was actually PID and tubo ovarian abscess secondary to diverticulitis. So this is uncommon, but you can have direct spread of infection from diverticulitis or even appendicitis uh, causing PID. This patient did go on to percutaneous CT guided drainage and that collection did yield E. coli and bacteroides which are more typical for GI flora as opposed to the chlamydia and gonorrhea you would expect for run-of-the-mill PID. So that's just something to keep in mind when it's a patient who has what appears radiographically as PID and tube ovarian abscess but the clinical history doesn't quite fit. Keep looking for another secondary cause. Now, this is an entity that can be confusing to the radiologist. This was a patient with pelvic floor prolapse repair and then presented with fever and clinical suspicion of abscess. And at first glance, this indeed looks like it may be an abscess. There is this gas-containing ovoid collection within the right hemipelvis, the surrounding inflammatory stranding. Uh, you may think it's an abscess, but it's a little unusual in that it has somewhat linear areas of gas and has a lobulated contour. And indeed, this is Surgis cell. This is oxidized regenerated cellulose. And this is a knitted fabric that causes thrombus formation due to the construct of its physical matrix. And it's used for intraoperative hemostasis, so it's intentionally left in the surgical bed because it's bioabsorbable, unlike sponges. Unfortunately for the radiologist, it has a variable absorption time, and studies have shown that you may see gas within this cellulose for at least 35 days. A different but similar entity gel foam has also been shown to have gas within its absorbable gelatin sponge for up to 38 days, but it doesn't seem to persist beyond 56 days. So what happens is air gets trapped in the interstices of this fabric and it will mimic an abscess, but it appears more as these focal linear collections of gas within masses of mixed attenuation, so it doesn't quite look like an abscess. So, of course, abscess will be in your differential diagnosis, but it's important to check for the details of the operative note. And always have surgery cell in the back of your mind when you see what may be an abscess in a postoperative patient. And that's it for Pelvic Inflammatory Disease Part 2. I hope you found that helpful. Again, you can visit the website for references, and if you have any questions or comments, you can leave those there as well, and I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Mm -hmm.